Now, we have been examining some very important lessons in regard to child training over the past day or two, which has brought great encouragement and even good results too among some of our parents here in the camp in the campground. And um, our minds turn, of course, to this publication called Child Guidance, which is designed to teach these principles. However, I must say I'm just a little disappointed in the book, not in the author, of course, but disappointed because of the compilation of the statements and the order in which they are compiled. Now, we must remember there's a difference between a book like, shall we say, Desire of Ages, which is a direct book written by Sister White in the first case, and a book like Child Guidance, which is a compilation put together by men who had no understanding of the principles of the gospel. So would you expect the priorities in this book to be as they should be? Not by any manner of means. In fact, um, it is not until I think it's chapter 76. Let me just check on that again. Um, it's chapter 76, I remember it now. Chapter 77, chapter 76. No. It's not, not till chapter 77. And... Uh, and then chapter um, 78 there is right down at the end of the book there's a very short section that deals with the spiritual training of the child in the sense of um, the child becoming a born again Christian even then I don't think they really put into, into the uh, into the into the compilation the kind of statements we would be looking for that talk about having a spirit of obedience and so forth now, all the previous chapters are dealing with um, training in other words it assumes that training is the most important thing but we have to recognize of course that you can spend your life training a thorn bush and what do you end up with thorn. a thorn bush right so what then is the very first work is to root out the thorn bush and replace it with the apple tree and then devote your time and energy to training an apple tree and of course the results are going to be very very much better in fact much more satisfactory so don't be surprised if when you read this book you find it doesn't support very clearly what we've been talking about over the past couple of days. And that's not any fault of Sister White, of course, that's the fault of the, of the compilers who put these statements together in very much the wrong order. And that's in my, in my thinking anyway. Now, of course, the chapters on training will be of great value to you, uh, provided you remember that your first work is to make sure that you have something worthwhile training, namely an apple tree and not a thorn bush that you begin with the work of uh, making certain that the spirit of obedience is implanted in the child. That's your first and most important work. And having achieved that, of course, then comes the very earnest and dilig diligent work of, um, of um, training the principles of truth and righteousness into the child. And those of you who have experienced the transforming power of God, those of you who know the work of Reformation which follows the work of revival and have read the book on that subject will recognize, of course, that the same work precisely which is necessary in your experience must also be done in the experience of your children. The same procedures precisely. The only difference being, of course, that in them the habits and ideas and theories have not become as deeply ingrained as they have in our older minds. And therefore the task must be considerably easier so far as they're concerned. You know, if you go out in the nature and you find a seedling tree, shall we say, about a foot high with a thin stem no more than an eighth of an inch thick, it's a very simple matter to take a piece of wire and wrap it around that trunk and bend it in any shape you like, even the spiral if you want to. And if you go out there day after day and just keep readjusting the wires as the trunk grows thicker so it doesn't cut into the trunk, then after four or five years you've got a tree, shall we say, 10 or 15 feet high, which retains the shape that you put into it when it was a little thing, and now you try and straighten it out now, and what's, what's, what's the result? You just can't do it. And so likewise, it's much more difficult to straighten out a mind which has spent, shall we say, 10 or 20 years developing certain habits and practices than it is to set a child's mind learning good habits and practices to begin with. Well, let's come back now to the Desire of Ages, and um, we'll... Um, Look a little further now into the life of Jesus Christ and we'll stand amazed at the miracle of that child's development. We look now on page 71 to notice that Jesus Christ was not a child who was 
who is especially sheltered from the power of temptation because Satan was permitted to tempt him unceasingly and as you read these pages you learn that Jesus Christ tasted of all the bitterness of persecution and rejection and misunderstanding and criticism which of course to our sensitive child is a very very serious thing the older ones of course can rise above that and brush it off to a certain extent if not entirely but you notice how much a child suffers when he feels rejected by his fellows and, and especially by his peers now I read page 71 the life of Jesus was a life in harmony with God while he was a child he thought and spoke as a child but no trace of sin marred the image of God within him yet he was not exempt from temptation the inhabitants of Nazareth were, were proverbial for their wickedness the low estimate in which they were generally held is shown by Nathaniel's question can there any good thing come out of Nazareth John 1 verse 46 Jesus was placed where his character would be tested it was necessary for him to be constantly on guard in order to preserve his purity he was subject to all the conflicts in which we, uh, which we have to meet so he might become an example to us in childhood, youth and manhood and note that Jesus Christ was an example to us in, at three levels as a child, as a youth and as a man in other words what Christ was as a child our children also can be that's, that's a staggering thought isn't it when you think about it just as faultless, just as perfect, just as pure just as unvaryingly faithful to God's principles as Christ was so our children in turn can be and I can imagine us adults here today wishing that we could uh, wind back the clock of time and have wise Christian parents who understood these principles and uh, to, have, to have grown up from childhood as Jesus grew up from childhood so we in our childhood and our youth and our adulthood could be exactly as he was would that be a very wonderful life to live it would have been a very painful life too don't forget because such a life does not uh, survive in this world without tremendous opposition and persecution it's the kind of life which stands a continual rebuke to the unrighteousness and sinfulness which is around us and it's the kind of life the world desires to be rid of they don't like that kind of witness in fact that, that is the thing in Jesus Christ which caused the Pharisees to hate him as implacably as they did now we read the next uh, paragraph on page 71 a very meaningful paragraph Satan was unwearied in his efforts to overcome the child of Nazareth from his earliest years Jesus was guarded by heavenly angels yet his life was one long struggle against the powers of darkness that there should be upon the earth one life free from the defilement of evil was an offence and a perplex perplexity to the prince of darkness he left no means untried to ensnare Jesus no child of humanity will ever be called to live a holy life amid so fierce a conflict with temptation as was our saviour <clears throat> so that um, without question then of course the um, the child of the child of Jesus Christ was one of great pressure and um, note the last sentence again no child of humanity will ever be called to live what kind of life a holy life which is an obedient life and a life of faith amid so fierce a conflict with temptation as was our saviour now at this point we'll spend a few moments looking at the subject of marriage because marriage provides the environment for successful child training let's turn to Ephesians the fifth chapter and um, I believe that the principles laid down in this particular statement are understood and practiced we're going to find that there will be very very successful and happy homes very successful and happy homes I'd like to read first of all the um, the statement which begins with um, somewhere about verse, verse 20 and we read from verse 20 down to the end of the chapter first of all and then we'll come back and examine the principles that Paul has laid down in these particular verses giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God wives submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord for the husband is the head of the wife even as Christ is the head of the church 
and he is the saviour of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in, every, in everything. Husbands, love your wives even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. That he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but there should be holy and without blemish. So what men to love their wives as their, as their own bodies, he that loveth his wife loveth himself. For no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourisheth and cherisheth it even as the Lord the church. For we are members of his body, of his flesh and of his bones. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother, and shall be joined unto his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Nevertheless, that every one of you in particular so love his wife, even as himself, and the wife see that she reverence her husband. <clears throat> now, this is not an arbitrary command, and very obviously, of course, a husband, in order to merit the respect of his wife, must be capable of, of calling forth that respect. He must be a man... Of, the, of such fitness and capacity that he, that he can be respected and, and, uh, and uh, made the head of the house. And so I'm going now to look at this from the point of view of what the man should be and what the woman should be and how they should relate themselves to each other. And you'll notice that Paul does not say in verse 23, for the husband is the head of the wife and stop there, does he? He doesn't say that. He, but he goes on to say even as Christ is the head of the church so once again what is the strong little word there yeah. as right <clears throat> even as Christ is the head of the church so in the same way that Christ is the head of the church in the same way the husband is to be the head of the wife now at the same time verse 25 husbands are to love their wives even as Christ also loved the church once again, the word as comes through as a very strong word in this particular, particular sentence. Now, when we have a situation where a competent man, a man capable of being a good husband, and certainly Christ is a very competent husband, isn't he? In every sense of the word. When we have a family situation where the man is able to be and is the head of the house as Christ is the head of the church, and when that man loves his wife as Christ loves him, and when in turn the wife looks to her husband as the head of the house and loves him as she in turn loves Christ and, and as a husband loves or should love Christ, then we have got a perfect environment in which to bring up children, haven't we? That's where it all begins, right back there in the relationship between the parents in the first case. Now we're living today, of course, in a, in a time when there's an appalling number of divorces and broken homes. And any of you who've had anything to do with a broken home, been witness to it or experienced it, know that this is, this is a desolating, devastating thing for the children, right? They're the real sufferers in a broken home. So then we have two extremes now. We have, first of all, on one side, a home which I just, which I just described where the husband is truly the head of the house and loves his wife as Christ loves him. And the wife loves and respects him as she is as she loves Christ or is supposed to love Christ and as he loves Christ that's one extreme that's one side of the picture and that's the ideal basis for bringing up children the ideal basis a truly unified Christian home at the other extreme is a situation where the husband and the wife have become separated from each other it has led to divorce no doubt and there's, there's wrangling over who's going to get custody of the children now that is the very worst situation for children to be raised up in, isn't it? The very worst. And of course in between we have uh, a, a varying shades from white through to black, varying sh various shades of grey, various situations which are uh, increasingly bad as we move from one side toward the other side. We have homes of course where father and mother still live together but they tolerate each other. It's just merely a matter of... Uh, now a business relationship and perhaps for the sake of the kids they don't split up but they no longer love each other and um, there are other situations where there's some love left but there's a lot of quarrelling and bickering and disagreements well obviously those things have a very bad re reaction upon the children so let's see today if we can learn something about what makes a happy home and as we look into this 
that those of us who are finding perhaps the beginnings of separation develop or even advanced separation developing make a review and recognize where we made our mistakes. And I'd like to observe that as I've given this particular study to folk in California and uh, other places across the world, the number of folk have come to me and said, well, I sure wish I'd known all that many years ago. I would make a, would have made a much happier um, marriage with, with my marriage partner. All right, then, let's come back now and look first of all at the husband because I believe that the greatest responsibility for a successful home rests with the husband and his relationship and attitude toward his wife, especially in view of the fact that he is uh, the stronger physically of the two, or usually is the stronger physically of the two. Now, if you go out to the world and ask the average um, person who should be the head of the house, what will they say? They'll say the man, right? And, and women will admit that they would like to have a strong, competent man to be the head of the home. Okay, but today we see, of course, that there is what they call the feminist movement or the women's liberation movement, and more and more, what are women doing in our present society? Claiming the headship in the home, isn't that right? And is it, is it producing a happy result, consequently? No, it's not. Now, why have women done this? There, there, there has to be a cause, because every, every reaction is a result of some action. And um, it is caused by two things. One, the natural disposition for a human being to rebel against God's way of doing things. That's one point. And number two is because men have, and let's look at the thing frankly and honestly, men have, especially in previous generations, used their authority as head of the house to really rule the house in a despotic, demanding, selfish fashion. And because of that there has been this reaction and it's a very understandable and uh, almost justifiable reaction. Of course, unfortunately, all the reactions that take place in the world today, they do so without the gospel. Um, I think I think his name is Spock. It was, it was a famous... Um, no, not the actor, not in, not in, not in Star Trek. No, it is, it is Spock. A child raising... Yeah, that's the one, yeah. Ex <laughs> right, that's the one. It's not Spock on TV, no? <laughs> no. <laughs> the big-haired guy? <laughs> well, now, for many, many years, apparently he advocated that you don't um, punish your children, you don't, you don't force them to obey, and then eventually his children became uh, virtually criminals and were taken in by the police and given prison sentences and so forth. Now, I understand this man's gone on national television and repented of his counsel over all those previous years and said, well, there is a place for the whip in bringing up children. Now, that man, of course, had a very strong point, and I've been advocating too over the past uh, few weeks that we don't bring up our children by force. Now, the difference between our position and his position is this, that we have the gospel, right? He didn't. And when you don't have the gospel, then you've got to have the whip because... When you don't have the gospel, there is in the child the spirit of disobedience and the only way to control that disposition is to use force if you don't have the gospel. If you have the gospel, of course, then through the gospel God gets rid of that spirit of disobedience and puts into the child the spirit of obedience. And then, of course, you're going to find that um, corporal punishment is uh, hopefully completely unnecessary. There might be occasions, maybe, perhaps, possibly, well, you might have to use it, but um, if the parent is a wise and understanding parent, it'll never be necessary at all. But, but remember this, the gospel, of course, is a vital element. And it's impossible for a man to love his wife as Christ loves him unless that man has in him the same love that Christ had in him. Isn't that right? It's impossible. You can't love as Christ loved without the love of Christ. That's, that's just not possible. So therefore... The very, very first qualification for a husband and the very first thing a girl should ask in regard to her future husband, the man that she is dating or keeping company with at the present time, getting to know, however else you like to express it, the first question she asks is, will this man love me as Christ loves him? That's the first question. And the next question will be, in order to determine that, does this man understand the gospel and does this man have in him the love of God? Does he have it there? If he doesn't have it, then she'd be a very, very foolish person to marry that man. 
even though the alternative is to live, live, a, uh, live life as a spinster. That, of course, is a very unattractive prospect, isn't it? <laughs> to some girls at least. And understandably so too, because the natural instinct of a woman is to marry and have a family and to um, serve, serve a husband. I'll turn now again to page 551 in the book Acts of the Apostles, and um, just note uh, again this one sentence which says a supreme love for God and unselfish love for one another this is the best gift that our Heavenly Father can bestow this love is not, a, not an impulse but a divine principle and permanent power the unconsecrated heart cannot originate or produce it only in the heart where Jesus reigns is it found we love him because he first loved us in the heart renewed by divine grace, love is the ruling principle of action. It modifies the character, governs the impulses, controls the passions and ennobles the affections. This love, cherished in the soul, sweetens the life and sheds a refining influence on all around. Now that love is the gift of God. It is the spirit of love. It is the redeeming power which fills the heart and controls every other motive. Now, in, back on the same page I read these words in heaven their fitness as workers is measured by their ability to love as Christ loved and to work as he worked now can we just reapply the statement to a husband and uh, word it as follows now in respect to what we're talking about so in respect to, to the possibility of this man being your marriage partner his fitness as a husband must be measured by his ability to love as Christ loved and to work as he worked. Would you accept that uh, application? Is, is, that, is that the truth then? Right? In other words, a husband's fitness or, or a man's fitness to be a successful husband is measured by his ability to love as Christ loved and to work as Christ worked. Okay? So therefore, young men, if you want to be successful husbands, then you must first of all understand what the gospel is you must experience the power of that gospel and by the ministration of that gospel you must have implanted within you the love of Jesus Christ so you can love as Christ loved but that's not enough you must also understand the principles of God's kingdom you must understand that no man is to be the head of another person in the sense of governing that person's life now Jesus Christ is the head of the church let's um, read one or two statements in this regard in the same book of Ephesians we find back in um, in chapter 1 and verse uh, 22 of Ephesians the first chapter we find these very plain words in regard to what God has done for Jesus Christ and has put all things under his feet and gave him to be the head over all things to the church which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all and we go to, we, we, now let's go to chapter 415 we have the same um, thought expressed by speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things which is the head even Christ so what is Jesus Christ in relationship to the head? Right, he is, um, I beg pardon, what is Christ in relationship to the church, I meant to say? He's the head, isn't he? Okay. But now, for a young man to be a successful husband, he must study Jesus Christ in that role to see how Christ occupies that role. Now, one thing that God never does is to force. He never uses any kind of force or compulsion to make us believers in him. I'd like to... Um, read two statements one from Desire of Ages page 6, 7 uh, no, 761 rather 761 no, it's not 759 759 759 is yes, is correct I was confused with another statement in page 759 we read these words in regard to uh, God's uh, principles of government it says God could have destroyed Satan and his sympathizers as easily as one can cast a pebble to the earth but he did not do this Rebellion was not to be overcome by force. Compelling power is found only under Satan's government. Now let's, let's emphasize those words. Compelling power is found only under Satan's government. The Lord's principles are not of this order. His authority rests upon goodness, mercy and love. 
and the presentation of these principles is the means to be used. God's government is moral and truth and love are to be the prevailing power. Now the point is this, if compelling power is found only under Satan's governments, and if a husband upon this earth claims to be a Christian and therefore professes to establish a little heaven in his home, then how much compelling power is to be found under his government? None whatsoever, right? None whatsoever. Now if we go back to page 22 in the same book, Desire of Ages, the second statement along these lines supports the, um, the point I'm just making here. And um, it says, The earth was dark through misapprehension of God, that the gloomy shadows might be lightened, that the world might be brought back to God, Satan's deceptive powers to be broken. This could not be done by force, right? This could not be done by force. The exercise of force is contrary to the principles of God's government. Now, that if, if they're contrary to God's government, if we're going to love and govern and be the head of the house as Christ is the head of the church, then the exercise of force must also be contrary to the principles of our government. I talk now about men. Uh, uh, I say I'm a man, of course. And um, therefore, husbands should find then that the exercise of force should be contrary to the principles of their government. If they have to govern by force or something very seriously wrong somewhere. Christ desires, or God desires, only the service of love, and love cannot be commanded. It cannot be won by force or authority. Only by love is love awakened. To know God is to love him. His character must be manifested in contrast to the character of Satan. This work only one being in all the universe could do. Only he who knew the height and depth of the love of God could make it known. Upon the world's dark night the Son of Righteousness must arise with healing in his wings. Now, <clears throat> there is one way, of course, of being head of the house by exercising force and dictatorship and so forth. And um, no doubt you've known men who've, who've acted out that role. I certainly know one. My father was like that. And uh, he died, of course, when I was only about seven years of age, which I think was very fortunate for me because um, when a child is ruled by the heavy hand of a legalistic dominant, domineering father, that child then develops fear of other people and I'm thinking particularly of um, one case that I was uh, involved in giving counsel and so forth and this, this, this woman had grown up and married and uh, she feared her husband even though he was kind and gentle she feared her father, she feared all men because her father had been such a despotic, overbearing, domineering, force administering father all during those childhood years and, she, and, and because that kind of father is capricious one day he wants one thing next day something else suits him so you never know quite how to please that kind of father and, uh, and therefore fear was the inbred um, I shouldn't call it quality but inbred um, well, disposition um, in, in, inbred liability in that girl's experience and really we went a long way toward ruining her own marriage with her own husband as well so then, uh, coming back to the point then that husbands are to love their wives as Christ loves them. Now, when Christ loves us, the only kind of service he accepts from us is, an, is, uh, is a service of love and intelligent love. In other words, an educated, intelligent love. That's the only kind of service he'll accept. And if we choose not to give that kind of service to him, if we choose to build a world of our own and go our own way, then what does Christ do about it? Does he reach out and say, now come here, come here, straight, I'll straighten you out and make sure you go right, you should do this and should do that? Is that Christ's attitude? No, no it's not. Christ lets us go. He gives us total freedom to go our own way if that's what we want to do, doesn't he? Now, as we've learnt in the Sabbath rest message, the great tragedy of history is this, that when the Lord called a people, and that people became his bride or his church, that for, to begin with, in the very happy honeymoon days, the church did God's work or Christ's work as Christ wanted it done. Okay? But then when they found that doing Christ's work as Christ wanted it done incurred danger and threat to them, then they began to make plans for God's work themselves and began to do God's work the way they thought that they ought to do it. 
right, they began to serve Christ as their husband, not according to his directives as to how he should have been served, but according to their ideas of how he should be served. So when this happened, of course, the separation began, and the Lord let them go their own way without, without um, using any force of compulsion to bring them back. Certainly, of course, the Lord tried to, to, to educate them. He tried to uh, love them back, but, but he gave them complete freedom to go their own way if that's what they wished to do. Now, let's now begin to look at the woman's role in marriage. Because I want to now develop the man's role a little further by looking at the woman's role in, in marriage. Now, a woman's role is to live her husband's life with him. In other words, he is the one, very often from, from sheer force of circumstances, who determines what kind of life they're going to live and more or less where, they, where they're going to live, what kind of occupation he will be following through. Because he is the one who has to go out and earn the daily bread. And of course, if he's called as a missionary and is sent to far distant lands across the sea, then what must she be, she be, she be prepared to do? Go with him, right? And live his life with him. Now we find many instances, however, where women marry with the great determination of living, of continuing to live lives of their own lives, and they have all their little ambitions and dreams and ideas. They look upon the husband as the power force and the money earning force to enable them to live out their dream. Have you seen that sort of situation? Right? Pardon? <laughs> <laughs> I'm thinking of one, one case in particular and the marriage has broken up which doesn't surprise me in the, in the least but one case right here in America where a young woman prided herself on being an, an independent thinker she prided herself on maintaining her individuality she prided herself on building up her own interests instead of standing side by side with her husband and she, and she looked upon her husband as an instrument to come and be her servant and carry out her will and to use his mind to build her dream home and all these various things. And he was very patient about it, of course, but eventually they did break up and they were now separated. That reminds me, of course, of the Jewish nation. Before Jesus Christ appeared upon this earth, the Jews were quite anxious to be delivered from the Roman power, as you remember. And they looked upon Jesus Christ as the servant of their ambitions. That when he arrived with all his tremendous power, the power to heal the sick and to uh, heal the wounded in battle, to supply whole armies with food, they, they said, well, now you're a Jew, therefore you have to be a Roman's hater, and we have all the plans to get rid of these Romans, and so we, and they expected Jesus Christ to take his power and add it to their plans to make their plans work. Now, so what kind of bride was the church in the days of Christ? Were they loving Christ as he loved his father? Were they obeying him as he obeyed his father? Not for one moment. And of course, what happened to that marriage between Christ and the Jewish people? It founded, right? It absolutely founded. Now, all probably about four or five years ago when I was here in the States, um, I um, was watching the news in the, in the Morning Today show and... Um, there was a feature about um, a great number of eligible women, successful business women, wealthy women in, in the city of Denver, Colorado. And uh, the question was raised, why so many unmarried eligibles in, in Denver, Colorado? Well, they, at first they thought there must, there must be a shortage of men to marry them. So they made another survey and found there was an ample number of young, young men between the ages of 25 and 40, the matching age group for these successful executive women, and they too were single. And they said to, to the men, well, why don't you marry these women? There's plenty of them out there. Why do you live single lives? And the men were very frank about it. They said, well, they said, if we marry those women, they said, we'll, we'll be marrying uh, not a partner, but almost a, a competitor. In other words, those women, those women are concerned with their, with their good jobs. They want them to stay home and take care of a family. If they have children, let them out to a babysitter, and babysitters don't uh, train the child like you want them trained, do they? They never do, because they have their principles or, or lack of them, and you have your very different principles. And those men were not prepared to marry professional women. And I don't understand why, of course. And the women made it very, very clear they'd be, they'd be very happy to marry, provided they could maintain their own separate individualistic lives. 
Now this doesn't, um, this is a different thing of course from a woman going out uh, before the children arrive to work a little to help build up the financial base of, of the home, that's one thing. But to pursue a career, um, your own career is distinct and separate from your husband's, that does not produce a successful marriage situation. Now a woman therefore, doesn't, she doesn't have to get married does she? That, that's her choice. A woman if she has, has talents and education, has a career worked out for herself, she can if you want to forego marriage and spend a whole lifetime pursuing her career. That's fine, that's her choice if she wants to do that. The same as Christ did not have to step down from his position as God in the universe and devote himself to uh, the bride, the church, um, providing a ministry which that church needed. We know, of course, for instance, that going back to the very original situation, there was God and Christ, as we know him, and they were both God on equal terms, the same as the third person, the Holy Spirit, is also God as God the Father is. And then when the first creatures were made, whom I shall here call angels, there was a communications problem, because how could these angels, who are mere creatures, approach to God who was such a, um, a, a, an enormous power force, they couldn't come into his presence without being destroyed. So Jesus Christ saw the need and he stepped down and he occupied this position. And when Christ occupied that position, it was a tremendous sacrifice for him to do so. The same as, in a certain sense, as a sacrifice for a woman to give up her freedom and give her life to another person. Is that a sacrifice, in a certain sense? Right, it is. It's a joyful one too, isn't it, mostly? <laughs> I hope it is. Now, once Christ has stepped in to occupy that position, <laughs> you caught it on in the end, eh? <laughs> now, once Christ has stepped in to occupy that position, then, he, then he, he put away forever and forever any thought of going back to build his own interest and kingdom. He is now devoted to the service involved in this marriage between divinity and the creature, between the creator and the creature. And likewise, a woman must make the same decision. Is she going to marry or is she going to stay single? Now, if she marries, what must she do? She must meet the obligations of that marriage and she must live her husband's life with him. They two must become one. Their interests must be common. Their ideals must, must um, match each other. In other words, they become almost duplicates of each other in a truly integrated marriage. And this does not mean that a person's individuality is entirely submerged. There can be such a thing as... Um, individuality in this unity and that's a very very beautiful arrangement for instance when Christ marries us and we become like him in thought word and deed yet we are still individual people we still have our own individuality our own um, recognizable individuality and the same thing should be in marriage too so then when a husband is choosing a wife he must, he must ask himself the question Will this woman love me as I in turn love my Saviour and as she in turn loves her Saviour? So the first thing he asks himself is how does she relate to Jesus Christ? Right? Does she understand the principles of human relationship to Jesus Christ? Does she believe in the Sabbath rest principles? Does she work with Christ as Christ wants her to work with him? Does she have a submissive spirit or is she determined to in some way manifest her own individuality? Now, if he finds that she understands these principles, then he can trust her to live his life with him, and he knows then that he can love her as Christ loves him, and she will love him as he loves Jesus Christ. And when those questions are satisfactorily answered, and at the same time it is seen that, that she has the training to be a competent wife and to fill that position, while he in turn is also competent to fill, that, fill his position, then if a marriage is approached on this basis, and these questions are satisfactorily answered, then what prospect does that, does that marriage have for happiness? Every prospect, right? In fact, such a marriage can't fail, can it? It'll be a true revelation of the character of God upon this earth. Now, when we talk about these principles, it becomes very, very apparent that no Christian girl in particular can ever marry an unbelieving husband. Or can she? Because of the very nature of her dedication to her husband. If she in marriage is saying... I dedicate myself to live my husband's life with him. But that life is the life of a worldling. When she has previously said to Jesus Christ, I will live your life with you, then how could she live Christ's life with him and the life of a worldling with him 
at the same time. Is that possible? It's impossible. It is absolutely impossible. One or the other must go. Now, of course, when it's a different story when you when you marry the person out there in the world and you later become a Christian yourself, which has happened to quite a number of you folk here, here in the movement. That's, that's a different story, of course. You then have to make the very best of your situation. And it now means, of course, that you're making a, a, a marriage with Jesus Christ, which will make your marriage to your husband a little difficult in some areas. And uh, you face the risk, of course, of the marriage breaking up. It's a risk that you have to take. But in this case, of course, Jesus Christ becomes the priority, the one who gets your first loyalties, and your earthly husband gets your secondary, secondary loyalties. Well, hopefully you pray that he will come into harmony with Jesus Christ and then there's no more conflict when, when that time comes. But let me stress the fact, of course, that husbands in loving their wives must give their wife complete freedom to go their own way if that's what they want and to pay the price of going their own way if they do go their own way. No pressure nor force must be used, used whatsoever. He must surround her with love, with understanding and with patience. But if she is determined to go her own way, then he must give her complete and total freedom to do so. Of course, he'll be accused of all kinds of weird and wonderful things, that's for sure, if he does give her this freedom. Because he'll say, she'll say, you don't love me anymore and you don't care for me anymore. But, but just as Christ is not moved by the complaints of his bride, so we too must not be moved by any complaints issuing from a marriage partner who is not able to understand and appreciate the freedom and love which we are giving to them. And of course, as fellowship breaks down, we endure that and patiently let it happen to us and wait until the thing finally comes to an ultimate separation or a reinstatement, as the case may be. So the key thoughts in these, uh, in these words in regard to um, Paul's instruction are that wives are to submit themselves unto their own husbands as unto the Lord. In other words, as the wife relates herself to Jesus Christ, as she submits herself unto her Lord, she is to do the same thing so far as the husband is concerned, provided, of course, that the husband is worthy of that kind of uh, relationship. If he isn't, if he's a, a, a despotic um, force, if he, if he governs by sheer force, if he's despotic and capricious, then obviously she can't submit herself to her husband as she submits herself to Jesus Christ, because the first word is to whom? Her divine husband, not, not to the earthly husband. And in turn, husbands are to submit themselves, I mean, to, to love their wives as Christ loves them. And if we find a man and a woman who can maintain this relationship to each other as, as Christ is to them and they to Christ, then believe me, we have a very, very wonderful home situation, a marriage which will not fail, a marriage which will be filled with true happiness and peace and unity and love, and children being born to those kind of homes are the most fortunate children you can find anywhere in the world. So let's make our children to be the most fortunate children they can be, shall we? Let, let us as husbands love our wives as Christ loves us, and let the wives respect and love their husbands as, Christ, as they in turn love Jesus Christ. And for young people in the movement who are contemplating marriage eventually, let these points be the, the questions you ask in regard to selection of a marriage partner. So that was 45 minutes once, once more gone into history. Didn't seem like I did it. <laughs> Any questions you'd like to ask on this presentation this morning? Very good, then this um, it must have been clear and plain. It's now... Uh, <laughs> No questions, you must have uh, been satisfied with what you heard. It's now 11 o'clock, let's plan to come back at 15 minutes past, that's about 14 minutes away from now, for our next study period, shall we? Yes. I think the Lord must know all our questions, so he answers them. <laughs>